Good morning and welcome to The Vine. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And it's my thrill and a privilege really to uh, be able to worship with you today. Thank you for taking the time to join us. This week we continue in our series about the letters that are found in the New Testament. And Pastor Julia is going to be our preacher today and she's going to be talking to us about 1 Corinthians. And we're going to learn a lot about what happened in the uh, Corinthian church and how the Apostle Paul addressed the issues of that day and see if there's something in there that we might learn as well. So I hope that you will um, be able to be inspired by our worship service today. And I hope that you will open up your heart and mind to, uh, to the message that has been laid on Julia's heart. Thanks for worshiping with us. Please join me in the opening prayer. Holy and loving God, we thank you that you know us fully. You see our hearts and know our desires, and we can't keep any secrets from you. In this time of worship, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts through the breath of your Holy Spirit, so that we can perfectly love you and fully praise your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you. Grant 
Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to me. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. I'm Pastor David Haley, one of your associate pastors, and I have the privilege of leading us in our prayer today. Let's bow together. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with grateful hearts as we're thankful for all the ways you have blessed us. In the life of our church, we're especially thankful for the vital participation of our children and youth. We recall that Jesus said, let the children come to me. May our church always be welcoming to children and youth who are responding to Jesus' invitation. Lord, we pray that you will bless the more than 200 children enrolled in our Vacation Bible School this upcoming week, and also the more than 80 volunteers who will be working with them. May the love of Jesus touch all their lives and bring them closer to you. On this Father's Day, we're thankful that you have set the example for all earthly fathers to be loving, nurturing parents. Lord, there are many needs today for your grace to touch lives and bring healing and comfort. We especially pray today for these whom we now name with our voices or in our hearts. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and help us in the ways we most need, we pray in Jesus' name. And as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, so now we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now it's time for the children's message. So if you have children or youth nearby who aren't already watching this worship service, now's a great time to call them over and who knows, you might get something out of this as well. Hey guys, I'm Pastor David and I've got the children's moment today. And uh, what do you think of this? I hope that kind of helped wake you up, right? <laughs> uh, did you like this music I'm playing? Yeah, no? Hmm. I don't blame you. It's a terrible sound, isn't it? It makes you kind of cringe. Um, well, our scripture today that Pastor Julia is going to read for us in just a moment is from a letter in the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul, the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13. And Paul explains in this chapter, among other things, that words without love are just like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Yeah, not something that we really like to hear. And what he means is that when we do a lot of talking about love, or a lot of talking without love, we are really just making a terrible noise that no one wants to listen to. For example, if I say, 
no, you can't play with my toys. Don't ever touch my toys. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. No one wants to listen to that. However, when I'm acting in love, my words will be a lot easier to listen to. Well, I'm playing with this toy right now, but let's look and see if I have something else that you might like to play with. Now see, isn't that nicer? That's because the love is there. Or how about if I say, you are so lucky that I'm your friend because I'm a great and wonderful person. Yeah, on the other hand, if I say, hey, I'm so glad that you're my friend. You see the love that comes through with that? So let's pray and ask God to help us to live in the love of Jesus and not sound like that noisy, clanking gong, okay? But rather to sound pleasant and that our words will always be filled with love. Let's pray. Dear God, we know that when we're not acting in love, our words will probably sound like a terrible clanging gong. Help us always to walk in your love so that our words will give a beautiful sound and an encouragement to others. Bless the children and youth watching this video today and their families and all the children and youth of our church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to get to bring you our scripture passage today. Right now, we are in the midst of a series that will last all summer, covering the letters of the New Testament. All of these are letters that were written by a specific person at a specific time to a specific community and addressing very specific needs. And yet we get to essentially read someone else's mail and in doing so learn so much about the Christian life. The letter that we're reading today is 1 Corinthians, which was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth in Greece in about probably 51 AD. Hear now this word from the 13th chapter. If I speak in tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we, your people, are longing today to hear from you. 
God, I ask that in this time you would use me to speak to your people. God, give me the words that you would have them hear. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A few days ago, I was at Hallmark trying to find a good Father's Day card for my dad. I'm sure that you've been there, going up and down the aisles and seeing all of these various cards that all have some sort of lovely, sentimental message on them. There's almost always one that I can find that I do think really expresses the way that I feel. Do you ever wonder who writes those? It must be the strangest job to sit in an office somewhere and try to write lovely words that other people can use to confess their own love. Well, the words that we've just read have been used, I'm sure, in countless Hallmark cards. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's a beautiful sentiment. We read it at weddings. We embroider it on pillows and all with good reason. But we're mistaken if we think that this is basically just a Hallmark card. When Paul wrote this famous passage, it wasn't a Hallmark card. It wasn't an abstract sentiment meant to be applicable to hundreds of thousands of people he would never meet. No. Instead, this passage and the entire letter of 1 Corinthians was addressed to a specific people at a specific time and meant to address their specific problems. And boy, did Corinth in Greece have a lot of problems. Corinth was a booming metropolis. It was an important city for trade, which brought lots of money to the area, as well as plenty of immigrants who were looking for opportunity. It had a reputation as a place with lots of money, but no real culture. In other words, they had cash, but not class. Well, this meant that the church in Corinth was very diverse. There were people who Paul had converted by preaching on the streets. Any day laborers who could hear could confess faith in Jesus. But also, Paul had a lot of success going into synagogues, meeting with very well-educated and wealthy Jewish community members and converting them to Christianity as well. It's wonderful to have a community that is so diverse, but it can also cause complications. There were plenty of complications in Corinth. You see, there were some people in the church who were appalled by the idea of eating the meat that was sold in the markets, which was often sacrificed to pagan idols. This was especially abhorrent to those Jewish converts to Christianity. Remember, the Jewish people had strict rules about what they could and could not eat. That was central to their identity and their practice of faith. To even think of eating meat that wasn't prepared kosher, meaning not prepared according to the instructions of Jewish law, would be nauseating. Almost like if someone suggested to us that we eat cat or dog. But there were other church members in the community, especially those who were Gentile converts, who didn't see what all the fuss was about. They said, look, we know these idols aren't real, so why should it matter if our meat was sacrificed to a false god? These gods aren't real, so what can it hurt? Theologically, they were actually right, but relationally, they were dead wrong. They started making fun of the Christians who didn't eat the meat, basically saying that they were a bunch of fools who didn't understand Jesus's mission. There was also problems with worship in Corinth. There was this huge wealth gap between the richest and the poorest members of the Corinthian church with almost nothing in between. When they gathered together for the Lord's Supper, the people who were wealthy would bring their own food and feast on it and have plenty of wine, while the poorest members would go hungry without sharing. And then there was the issue of spiritual gifts. 
People were longing to be able to prophesy or speak in tongues. And when they came to worship, it was chaotic. People were speaking over each other and no one could understand. It's into this situation that Paul speaks. And what Paul says is to love. Love. Love is the thing that will transform all of their conflicts because at the base of all of their conflicts is a lack of right relationship. Let's be honest. Love seems simple and even obvious in the abstract. The problem is that love is never abstract. Love is a verb, which means that it only takes on meaning when it also has a subject and an object. Love seemed easy for the Corinthians until they realized what that actually meant. Love seems easy until you realize that it is you who has to do the loving, and the loving is towards all the real, messy, ordinary people that you're already around every day. Although Paul's words were written to a specific community, they have a timeless ability to teach us how to love one another as well. I wanna share with you two false forms of love, what Paul says in the refrain, love is not, and then one thing that love is that corresponds that can help us to love more rightly. The first is this, Paul says that love doesn't insist on its own way. Another way to say that might be, love doesn't assume it knows what is best for everyone. Assuming we know what's best for someone is a, an especially tempting trap in our closest relationships. Take parenting, for example. As a parent, you naturally feel that you know what's best for your child. After all, you knew that if they didn't go down for a nap, they would be cranky. You knew that they needed to eat at least some of their fruits and vegetables in order to be healthy. But as children get older, your ability to know what is best for them changes. It's not so black and white anymore. You might think that you know which group of friends is best for them, but you could be wrong. You might think you know how they should be studying for that big history exam, but you could be wrong. You might think that you know that they are never going to succeed at soccer, but have incredible untapped potential when it comes to field hockey, but you could be wrong. It's in our closest relationships that we are most tempted to believe that we know what is best for the other person. That comes from genuinely knowing a lot about them and genuinely maybe even having insight into their lives that they might not even have. The closer the relationship, the more you desire that person to be happy, to be fulfilled, to be safe. Assuming that we know what is best for someone is a way that our love for them comes out sideways. I learned this one the hard way when I was in college. One of my friends had been dating someone that I thought was no good. I was convinced that he was just stringing her along and was going to hurt her. Well, after one too many times sitting with her while she cried over something that this guy did, I decided that enough was enough. I told my friend that she should completely stop talking to this guy. I told her that I never liked him anyway and that she was better off without him. I told her that it was going to be hard, but that I would support her through this hard breakup. I insisted on my own way. Can you guess how well that worked out? It destroyed the trust in our friendship. I had made my opinion on her situation crystal clear, and I had made it clear that I would support her 100% so long as she did what I thought was best. She could no longer talk to me about the real complicated feelings she had about her relationship because I'd already made a judgment about what she should and should not do. I thought that love meant protecting my friend from heartbreak, 
But in reality, what I thought was love was actually just me insisting on my own way. She didn't need me to tell her what to do. She needed me to be there for her, to listen without judgment. I wasn't loving her. I was trying to control her. That brings us to the loving antidote for insisting on our own way. Paul says, love is patient. Can you imagine how differently my situation would have turned out if I had been patient with my friend? It turns out that she did eventually realize that this guy wasn't right for her. What if I had been able to walk with her through that, listening to all of the feelings that she expressed? instead of jumping to a conclusion about what she needed. True patience is powered by confidence that God's will will eventually be done. You don't need to insist on your own way because you know that God's way is better. And as much as you love someone, God loves them infinitely more. Patient love lets us endure with our loved ones when they struggle without rushing in with our fix. Once a man was out for a walk and hanging from a tree, he saw a cocoon. He loved butterflies and so he was excited to watch the cocoon as it developed and then one day to see the butterfly take flight. Well, for several days he walked by and always saw that cocoon. But then one day, as he was walking by, he could see the butterfly struggling from inside, trying to break out of its cocoon, and it didn't seem to be having any success. Well, he wanted to help this butterfly, so he pulled out his pocket knife and made a small cut in the cocoon to let the butterfly out. He watched as that butterfly crawled out of the cocoon and spread its wings for the first time and he waited to see it take flight into the sky. He was so excited. But then, instead of flying into the air, the butterfly fell to the ground and died. You see, it turns out that the struggle to break out of the cocoon is critical for the butterfly. That struggle is what develops it's an, enough of its wing strength to be able to fly by trying to help the butterfly to shorten its pain and speed up its journey, the man robbed the butterfly of the chance to develop. Here's something you can do to take action. When you find yourself wanting to control a person that you love, when you find yourself insisting on your own way, pause. Some signs for me that I'm insisting on my own way are thoughts like, if she would just do X, Y, or Z, she would be happy. Or, if he would just do it this way, he would be successful. When you catch yourself, name for yourself that what you are experiencing is love coming out in a sideways way. Thank God for the love that you have for that person and then ask God to help you let go of your insistence on your own way. Then entrust that person to God's care. Sometimes I like to imagine that I am handing that person over to God, knowing that God actually does know what is best for that person and actually has the power to bring it about. So we know that love does not insist on its own way but that love is patient. Also, love is not resentful. Resentment in love is one of the fastest ways to destroy relationship. Think about it this way. How many of these lines sound familiar? I have put in so many more hours than any of my coworkers. I have sacrificed so much for her and she's never even said thank you. Or the classic one, I am the only person in this house who ever changes the toilet paper roll. Sometimes when we're trying to respond in love, we end up doing things that our heart isn't in, and we end up just resenting the person. 
But if we take a look back, we'll often realize that no one ever asked us to do what we thought we needed to do. That thing that we did that made us sacrifice for love of someone else, they didn't want us to do for them in the first place. Resentment kills relationship. You don't have to look any further than Luke chapter 15 to see this. In this passage, Jesus tells the story of a son that has left his father and wasted all of his money. When he comes back, however, his father welcomes him home. You know the story. But the older brother isn't having it. He answers the father this way, Listen, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The elder brother was acting in resentment. He had done all of these things for his father, but instead of them being joyful expressions of love, they became something that he resented. Well, how can we work around this? Paul once again gives us an answer. Love is not resentful, but love is kind. One of my favorite phrases that I love to say is clarity is kindness. Our love can be kind by offering clarity to the people around us about what we need, what we can do, and what we can't do. You are allowed to ask for what you need. And if someone asks you for something that they need, love will have you do it. But if you know that you can't do it, say that you can't. Here's an action step. If you find that someone asks you to do something and you realize that you're not going to be able to do it without feeling resentful about it afterwards, don't do it. Truly, it will be better for the relationship to say no than it would be to say yes and resent the person afterwards. Love is hard. Love is complicated. And it makes demands on us every single day to love the people who are actually around us. But it can feel overwhelming. How am I to act this way all the time? Well, this is where the good news comes. In this section of 1 Corinthians, Paul describes love as a gift. It is a gift given by God, an ability bestowed on us by our Creator. You are not alone as you try to love those around you. I think about it like this. If I were using a drill to try to make a hole in something, I could try really hard to take it and shove it through a piece of wood and maybe twist it a little bit and maybe I might make some dent, but it won't be effective until I plug it in. As soon as I plug in that drill to its power source, I'll be able to easily drill through whatever I need to. The same is true in our life with God. When we try to do things in our own power, we might make a small dent but nothing will be compared to what happens when we plug in to God's power that's available to us. God never asks us to do something that God won't give us the power to do. So as you go throughout today even, and this week, when you have these opportunities to love, I challenge you to take a moment and ask for God's help. You don't have to do it alone. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the great love with which you love us. 
help us to love one another in the same way. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go today to love those around you. And as you go, may the spirit of the living God made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord go before you to show you the way. Go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own. Go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind blow at your